The views, comments, and opinions of the following program do not necessarily reflect those of Morris Media Studios, MorrisMediaLive.com, or its affiliates. Listener discretion is advised. What I can tell you, having listened to that recording, he does not at all mention anything about terrorism, nor does he mention anything about hate. It is the outcry of a very uh, challenged young man talking about challenges in his personal life. All right, this shit is ridiculous. No angel, thug, combative, career criminal, disrespectful. Were these terms used to describe evil white criminals who massacred their fellow Americans, or... Were these terms used to describe unarmed black men and children who were killed at the hands of police? Wait, hold on. What about these terms? Troubled child, nerdy, quiet boy, unemployed kid, clean-cut American, boy with dry-witted humor. So what about those terms? Were they used to describe white terrorists or black victims? The answer is, of course you already know what the fucking answer is, because this is the United States of America, the only country in the world where you can carry out five explosions, killing two people, and still be given the benefit of the doubt and depicted in a sympathetic light. As long as you're white, of course. But if you happen to be black and have your life taken unjustly, you will be scrutinized, vilified, and have your name dragged through the dirt. It has been merely 48 hours since Mark Condit blew himself up after being tracked down by law enforcement and, as we have come to expect in this country, the humanization of a man who blew two black Americans to pieces has been gut-churningly despicable. From law enforcement choosing to highlight challenged young man to a full New York Times article portraying the Austin bomber as a quiet, nerdy, godly young man, we have seen whiteness at work on steroids. And not only that, some conservative mouthpieces, take a wild guess who, took to Twitter to give the voice to the real victims in this act of terror, wait for it, Christians. That's right, our resident hypocrite Tammy made sure to skip her usual thoughts and prayers for the actual victims who died at the hands of this monster, and instead posted an article discussing how Christianity was the real victim. This coming from the same person who has built a career fear-mongering against all Muslims whenever an Islamist extremist commits an act of terror. But this all falls in line with the same deflecting, humanizing, and downplaying of the evil actions of a troubled young man. A troubled young white man, that is. So I ask, where was the stern defense of a young man like Trayvon Martin, who, by the way, did not try to blow anyone up? In fact, all he wanted to do was walk home, but God forbid he put his hood up, right? For that, he was lambasted as a disrespectful thug by many of those in the media who then offered an actual terrorist a pass. I I can't believe this has to be clarified. But I guess we'll save the best juxtaposition for last, shall we? It so happened that on the same day a white suicide bomber decided to take his own life, two Sacramento police officers opted to take the life of 22-year-old Stephen Clark, firing a mere, oh, 20 shots at him in his own grandmother's backyard. Cops said they mistook Clark's cell phone for a gun, oh, and then later a crowbar. I mean, I'm, I'm no tech expert here, but I've never seen a crowbar that looks even remotely like an iPhone, have you? But nonetheless... Having both these stories circulate at the same time was a perfect example of whiteness at work. On the one hand, we had headlines reading, Robbery Suspect Gunned Down, and on the other hand, we heard, Nerdy Young Man. Wake up! The way this country continues to humanize white evil and vilify black victims shows how far we have to go in not only fixing the engraved racial bias that still dictates the perception of people in this country and in the media, but in truly understanding the threat white terror poses to us. And to do that, we have to condemn it with the same furiosity it deserves, not wrap it in privilege. Follow me on Instagram at Francis M. Maxwell and on Twitter at Francis M. Maxwell. Please like and share this video. Welcome to Uncle Bobby's Country Corner, where real men don't play. And we also have a sister with us in honor of International Women's Month, who is just an exceptional lady. And I'm going to start with the introductions with Greg Cowan and his beautiful <laughs> wife, Miss Vivian Bowers Cowan, mm-hmm. to my extreme right, uh, no stranger to Uncle Bobby's Country Corner, a dear friend of mine, 
and uh, innovator and, his, and a historic figure in his own right, uh, Brother James Burks. How you doing, James? Very good. Thank you. Thank I started to show off with that clip to kind of just drill down on, a, on the importance of narratives and how they affect every aspect of our lives. And uh, to wit, today's theme is urban renewal. Is it Negro removal? Because that word urban renewal along with gentrification, it softens the blow. In some instances, at least that's that's why I think they chose that word gentrification. It sounds somehow, you know, just innocuous in some ways. It doesn't really do anything to you, but it sounds good until they start moving folks around. Some people coming in, other people moving out. And uh, the panel on the show today reflects the winners in our community. And to that uh, degree, when you watch that clip right there, what's your initial reaction to it? Well, you know, it's interesting because um, it's really nothing new. We've known about this for quite a while. So he's just basically um, uh, putting a stamp on what we've already known. Sister? And unfortunately, when I look at that, I think about our community being silent. We are not speaking up to me with the fervor that he had. And if we do, no one listens took my breath. And it's most unfortunate uh, it, it, uh, that we turn a deaf ear to our own. It's just like with us turning over our dollar in our community. We don't seem to do that. And um, we don't seem to raise our voices uh, to the height that they need to be in order for people to wake up and um, uh, make, a, make a change. Brother Briggs. Uh, when I hear, you know, just only an, an hour ago, I read this article from uh, from New Orleans, and it was talking about what not to do to keep from being black, mm-hmm. to keep from being shot by the police. And it's amazing to me because I, I was listening to this young white man uh, talk about the issues that we have to go through. And to be honest with you, I was very angry because I'm, I'm angry at the fact that I'm trying to figure out what's the solution, you know, um, because it's a, a multi-leveled solution for this. And no one thing, not one church, not one uh, elected official, not one good police officer, not one good politician or business person can fix this. You know, it's a it's a big problem. I grew up in L.A. and and it's been going on now. I'm 68. You know, it's been going on as long as I've lived in the in the city. You know, I um, as I absorb the responses to the question. I mentioned a minute ago, I'm in a room with winners, uh, and I think that that's a part of the solution, at least something that we can control anyway, is how we comport ourselves within the boundaries that we define as our quote-unquote communities. Mm-hmm. And where we sit right now, uh, I did a piece two years ago on on, um, on Facebook about uh, a response to the frustration people were having with the intrusion that's what some people felt like it was of other people moving into this this particular community, mm-hmm. and here we are two years later, and it ex- it has accelerated to the point where all of the major realtors, Sotheby's and <laughs> Keller Williams, and everybody is calling people on the phone and telling them, "Look, we offering cash, fifteen day escrow, mm-hmm. start packing." Mm-hmm. And our response has been, "Oh." Wow. And then when you see so many people walking strollers down Central Avenue, (laughs) okay. Uh, (laughs) Yes, yes. And feeling very comfortable in their new surroundings. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just saw the other day, and I know that this show will be seen by people in different parts of the country and maybe parts of the world. Uh, This corridor that we're in right now is unquestionably the hottest real estate area in the United States, in my estimation. And it is to the point now where there's some initiatives that we're going to talk about today. If it hadn't happened in your neighborhood already, wherever you are, as you watch this show, it's coming, if it's not already there. Uh, Detroit is reviving because, you know, the property has decreased to the point where the, the, the young white kids were incentivized to move to into move those in. neighborhoods. And that became a blueprint across the country. You know, mm-hmm. actually it happened in Harlem when Clinton was uh, uh, president and decided he was going to build his uh, 
library there. Yes. Mm-hmm. So this is not a real new trend, but we're at a stage now where I think it's imperative that we concentrate on the winners. And as I look to my left, we're talking about a lineage of winning and being community-oriented, business-oriented, opportunity-oriented. And just so that people become familiar with where I'm going with that, could you speak to the the Bowers Cowan tradition as far as enterprise is concerned? Well, I'll begin. <laughs> yeah, it's your month. You ain't got a couple more days, though. Okay. <laughs> Um, it shouldn't be contained in one month, but same with black history. Today. <laughs> right, exactly. And so we have to make a change. Okay. Um, Bowers and Sons Cleaners uh, started uh, oh in 1950 by my parents Horace and Alice Bowers. Um, they purchased the cleaners from her parents, uh, who brought it from Chicago in 1946. And um, I took over the helm in 1994, and my husband joined me in about 1999. Mm -hmm. And we've been working together. I'd say we're almost the mirror of what my parents did in 1950. And so it's it's a family tradition. Uh, It's something that we're very proud of. I consider us um, strongholds in the community Because against all odds, we are still there. Um, For any of you who know South Central, it has changed drastically. Mm -hmm. And yes, there was gentrification of another form, um, uh, probably starting in the early 90s when we went through another yet uh, civil unrest or riot, the Rodney King riot, Mm -hmm. and left the area once again depleted and uh, just devastated. And so at that point, we had uh, an insurgence of um, Latin Americans, Latinos, Hispanics, whatever the phrase is. And today, we not only see that, but we see uh, many other races. But there's a definite absence of African Americans along Central Avenue, which was once uh, our livelihood. It was our, um, it was our pride and joy. South Central, Central Avenue. Um, so we are happy that we are still there and uh, carrying on the tradition regardless of the environment. You know, a part of my uh, thing, excuse me just one second, please. It's, it's, hey, Barbara. Okay, could you let, okay. Yeah. Um, that, that melodic uh, voice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I uh, I have to admit that until I you know get to that next level, I'm gonna answer this phone, <laughs> especially when I know I got a guest covered that I really want to participate in in today's conversation. You know, with the backdrop of this being International Women's Month, uh, I'm gonna direct this question to you first, Greg. How were you able to merge into a, a such a prestigious family and, and maintain your, 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 your dignity and your man. Well, you know what? It, it wasn't that hard. I think it has more to do with what is your background? How were you raised? My mom was, is, I won't say was, is Dr. May Cowan, 32 years uh, <laughs> professor of early childhood education over at USC in Cal State Northridge. She demanded that you support each other within a family base. So when Vivian and I got together and I got married, it was a natural reaction to support her in what she did. It doesn't take away from me. Mm. You know, matter of fact, the funniest thing is along Central Avenue, my last name is Cowan, but for all true and purpose considerations, everyone up and down Central knows me as Mr. (laughs) Bowers. We had that running joke for a number of years now, and most Guys have trouble dealing with that, you know. So what would you recommend to young people, young brothers, particularly that find themselves attracted to a powerful woman? What would you say is the best approach to dealing with that? You know what? See the big picture. See what you can learn. See what can develop you. Try to make the relationship into one big whole and not constantly work against it. It doesn't do anyone any good for you to work against it. 
um, it's easier, the path of least resistance is to be supportive and learn. James, since I'm taking uh, the lead on this show, uh, why don't you take some notes for both of us? <laughs> <laughs> since we haven't got across that threshold. <laughs> but anyway, uh, let's flip that question around. Um, what kept you from running over him and spanking him every day? We don't know whether she did. <laughs> <laughs> that was a loaded question. <laughs> But first of all, that's not in my nature. Okay. Um, but secondly, I think what we decided early on, even in our marriage, was each person brings something to the table, a strength and a weakness. And it just, I think by God's divine order, worked out that way. He's mechanically inclined. Um, you know, there's all kinds of machinery at the cleaners. And while I had, I was baptized by fire... I was like, here are the keys, here's the machinery. As a woman, I never went to the back, really. I worked the front half. My mother and I worked the front half. The fellows, my brothers, and my father worked the back. But suddenly, I opened the door, and there is this dry cleaning machine that's running over, and a compressor, and a this, that, and the I didn't know how they worked, but I had to figure it out. Fortunately, again, I um, hate to use that word so much, being redundant, but... Greg came into my life, God delivered him, and he brought his power tools and his understanding of mechanics, and I was all hands off. I was delighted. So he had his area, I had mine. Um, the reason he did join me was because, and you've heard this before, Bobby, I had fired my driver. I was the driver, the dry cleaner, the, the counter person I was running all over, and mm -hmm. JPL, to their loss, had laid him off. And I said, please drive for me for a week until I find someone. Well, that week never ended. Mm. Mm. Because he is so good at what he does. His um, his persona out there, his, his ability to penetrate anything, any situation, any door, any barrier, uh, with courtesy and professionalism at all times, um, is just ideal for our business, which is we care enough to give a personal touch. Mm. Okay, so that keeps him out on the road, fifty percent of the time, and me inside. So you know that that's what makes it work. I have one small story. It was an interesting one. This was some years later. I got contacted by a man who um, I worked for, a supervisor at JPL. He said, "I just wanted to call because I want to tell you what happened." One of an engineer came to me and said, do you think Greg is falling on hard times? He said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I saw Greg, who was a top flight um, engineer, delivering clothes. said, well, he didn't fall on hard times. said, he simply went to work for his wife. And um, from that point on, I, I use that as a way of saying, a lot of times you have to bury the ego aspect of things. Mm -hmm. and just soldier on with what your abilities are. And I embrace that. So, James, as you sit here, uh, first of all... Well, we've met actually before. Yes, I uh, thought so. Uh, I'm yes. sure. Um, in the know. cleaners. <laughs> in the cleaners? <laughs> oh, well, we have, actually, we're doing something down south, and then I came and I gave you a poster of the African marketplace. Oh, that's it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. I didn't know that James saw, you saw the inside of the cleaners. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this I is a, this is a, this is good that we're again closing gap because last week's show when I had uh, some people in here that didn't know each other that needed to know each other, that's an ongoing ambition of mine is to close that that, that that onerous gap that keeps us from being comfortable knowing that okay I know what that person does and let's figure out a way to you know mm -hmm. commercialize well, I, that. So I've always wanted to meet Barbara Morrison because maybe one day you can introduce me to her. I'm <laughs> going to do that uh, very shortly. Um, and you fact, know, I have a stack of CDs I need her to sign. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, can, I can put them things on eBay. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm going no. to be listening to her tonight. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. That's, that's exactly oh, what's going to happen. Commercial. That's a commercial. I shouldn't have even say that, right? Yeah, you got to be, look at it, man, this is a Negro show, man. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we make exceptions over here, but not in terms of excellence. We just make room for the shining stars in our community because it's exciting because we're all big music fans, you know. Mm -hmm. Just last yes. night I went back and dug up some uh, some Lee Morgan, right? Okay. And 
I was like, man, it's only a few people left, man, that just uh-huh. go out night after night and yeah. give you that top shelf performance, you know. So in the interest of time, because she does have to get to a gig, you, you're not going anywhere. I just on, I want, I'm going to take a short break and, and bring them on. Then we're going to finish out the other aspect of the show. Okay, we'll be right black. All right, we uh, we're black, and ain't nothing we can do about it. I don't want to do nothing about it. <laughs> On some of these days, I ain't lying, boy. I'll be like, man, give me twenty four hours of the white man. I'll go give me some credit and everything. <laughs> 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 I was telling her, I told the white guy that the other day, though we were, we were looking around the, in the Vision Theater. So, you know, the difference between you and I is that you can be homeless one day and put on a suit the same day, walk in the bank and get a and get a 30 uh, year mortgage. I'm telling you, man. Why well, they tell me, well, we, it's going to take 30 days. <laughs> at the end of 30 days, well, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to help you. Yeah. You only have a 750. <laughs> <laughs> it's another world. Oh, man. I am honored to have in the. Um, the waning days of International Women's Month, one of the esteemed women in the world. Welcome back to Uncle Bobby's Country Corner, the the great Barbara Morris. Thank you, Uncle Bobby. That's, I'm honored to be here with you. Oh, uh, you're as radiant as ever. And uh, in the interest of time, because she's going to be performing at 7 o'clock tonight, right? Yes. At Pips on La Brea. 1354. 1354. South La Brea. South La Brea. And I have never seen this woman in the many years that I've known her not take the stage no matter how she's feeling. And that's the thing about entertainers that set them apart, if there's a, a distinction in life from most people. Their job requires them to give it whether they got it or not. And some of them fall way short. Mm-hmm. I have never seen this lady miss a note. <laughs> Ever. Yeah. Ever. And she gives you that and more. All right. Her repertoire is boundless, her energy is incredible, and her presence is just, it's legitimate. That's the best word, because she knows she's standing on some very broad shoulders. So, in the interest of time, 
first of all, you have two properties here in the Lamert Park area here in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And the theme for this the evening show has been urban renewal, Negro removal. It doesn't apply to you. How have you been able to stay here <laughs> in the midst of all the pressure to move out of this community? Well, you're sitting next to one of the guys <laughs> that's been keeping me here. Um, he is the... Is the epitome a word? Yes, good one. Of good unity and uniting people, he is a he is definitely a community servant. Mm -hmm. I feel that with him and with um, some others in our block, we have uh, decided that we're gonna, we're not going anywhere, mm. and this is this is where we belong. Tell us a little something about both of your facilities here in the Lamar Park area. Well, the Performing Arts Center came about when um, I contracted diabetes, and I, I had to come off the road. And I said, what can I do with my life? What can, how can I still do what I like to do? And then I looked around, and there's a whole lot of people that like to do what I like to do. There's a lot of singers, there's a lot of dancers and actors and actresses that never get a chance. And I looked, when I saw some of the greats in our community never get a Grammy and never get honored at City Hall and never get... I said, wait a minute, there's too many unsung heroes around here. And I decided, I looked down on the ground one day and there was a Sankofa passage, Sankofi, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> passage where somebody started honoring people, honoring our neighborhood. I said, hmm, how can I jump in and, and help? And I remembered... When I was younger, let's see, I'm 28 now. <laughs> hey, what's so funny, Uncle Bobby? <laughs> well, I ain't been 19 myself, <laughs> so what can I, I say? Went to, I went to my first trip to Europe. I got, well, I was in a band who had Bull Moose Jackson. And Bull Moose Jackson was working as a janitor at a, at a major university. And these white kids found out who he was. And they said, we're going to chip our money in and send you to Europe. Because he was telling them one day, I've never been to Europe. And he ended up in our band. Mm -hmm. Well, he couldn't walk that. He was bow-legged. That's where he's, one of his big hits was, I want a bow-legged woman, uh -huh. that's all. And I got a wheelchair. And I pushed him to every country we went to. Mm -hmm. And he was, and I, and I said to myself, he was 70 which is not old now. I mean, when I was a little girl, it was old, but now it's seventies nothing. Mm, thank goodness. But he yeah, had never we, he had closed never. it in. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one night we stayed in this hotel. It was very very expensive. It was about five hundred dollars a night, but the promoter was paying for it, and they had these this mini bar, and he and Freddie were roommates. And every night they would clean the mini bar out, mm -hmm. and put it in their suitcase. So at the end of the week, when they got the bill for the hotel, man, he looked at Freddie, and Freddie looked at him. He said, "Man, you owe me." They didn't know francs and Swiss francs and the different kind of money in Europe. And he said, "You, you owe me two thousand skindolis." <laughs> <laughs> And Johnny, being a, being a such a great artist, he drew a picture of them standing at the front desk, going, "Hmm." <laughs> <laughs> There's some unpacking to do, huh? <laughs> yeah, and I and I thought about all the people that in my neighborhood who had never, never experienced a, a cruise, never experienced a Cuba, Mister. I know you go to Cuba a lot. Yeah, I love it. Well, I'm I'm just saying that. And then, so, um, I refuse to let them say to me, oh, you think you're big time. So I wanted them to be big time, to see what it is. Not phonetically be big time, but let them see how you, you can be a normal person and do all these things. And it worked. We had a, a vocal class. Some, some people never ever been to Europe or da 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 and we took what about five, six people to Europe last year mm. so they get experience but they 
come to the center and they see certain things. They see all the international stars and it puts their creativity to work. And boy, they be putting on some good shows, Mm -hmm. some good shows. Speaking of good shows, what you got coming up here? Well, we have the uh, International Jazz Appreciation Month Festival. And it's going to be, it starts um, Sunday. Sunday. With Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson. And yep. who's the guy playing Paul Robeson? Stogie Kenyatta. Mm, he's that sounds like he, he, he should know something about it. Yeah, he's a big guy. What'd it take? You, oh, he's a big guy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Stogie's going to be at the... BMPAC, Barbara Morrison Performing Arts Center. That's right. Um, what's, what, what's that address? What time is it? 4305 Degnan, Suite 101, L.A., 90008. Sunday, he's going to be on at 6 o'clock. 6 and o'clock. Just to let you know, Sunday is Easter Sunday. Have mercy. Yeah, a lot of people go to church, so mm-hmm. we put it late, 6 mm-hmm. o'clock, in case but they want to come. Good, it's a good show. So we it's does a that show all over show. the country. You know? Really? Yeah, it's all over, it's all over I the saw, world. I uh, saw... All over the world. Yeah, yes. I saw Avery Brooks do Paul Robeson many years ago, and I saw our mm-hmm. collective friend Keith David do him. So I'm excited about uh, yeah. his rendition of that. Yes, yeah, it's a so different what, version. What else is going on? The whole month of April. We got the biggest one in California. We got the biggest celebration of Jazz Appreciation Month in California, maybe in the country. Wow. But um, uh, International Jazz Month, well, Jazz Appreciation Month was established by Herbie Hancock, and he's out. also uh, the director of jazz of the Thelonious Monk Institute at mm-hmm. UCLA. Mm. And his birthday happens to be April 12th. <laughs> Oh. But there's a lot of stars born in Ellis, April 25th, and Duke Ellington's April 29th. We have a lot, a lot of stars born in uh, in April. In April. So it's, it's fitting for the, the tribute to jazz to be in April. Well, I was at the White House last year. Did you see it? Who J- was? The Jazz Appreciation really? con- Concert. Herbie has established a concert in every city in the world. Wow. So what are some of the other... Outstanding. Well, we have a tribute tribute to um, Ernie Andrews. That's right. He's a local guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. We we got a lot of local heroes. Yeah. (laughs) Central Avenue, right? Ella Fitzgerald, Central Avenue. Mm -hmm. We got Andy Bay. We have a, and we have a a male doing a tribute to Sarah Vaughn. That'll be interesting. We got a we got a tribute to BB King. Thrill is gone. George Pohanna is doing a tribute to J.J. Johnson. Johnson. Oh, that's going to be special. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we have several, several tributes. We got uh, a bass tribute to Ray Brown. Mm, he played with everybody. And um, Joe Williams is our featured artist for the... Mm. Joe Williams will be 100 years old this year. Well, all I know is he told me to tell somebody, I forgot who it was, she made... She may be your woman, but she shall she come, come see me sometime. <laughs> <laughs> she comes so often, I'm beginning to think she's mad. <laughs> come back, baby. So we have, a, we have a big tribute to Joe and with the Count Basie Band, mm. and we have six male singers to honor Joe. That ought to be something, because last year, uh, the great Keith David put on a sparkling show at your facility yep, in he tribute did. to uh, Joe Williams and... Bill Withers, you know. Now, you just handed me something here that it warms my heart, being old country boys, the second annual uh, Muddy Waters Blues Festival, Saturday and Sunday, June 16th and 17th. A little bit about the genesis of that and why the blues is still all right. <laughs> the blues is our only, only original art form here in America. Uh, it came from our people, slaves and uh, Field chants and the picking cotton, the signals they sent to each other to keep uh, their independence and identity among themselves. And we happen to have at our center a descendant of Muddy Waters. And I just looked at him one day and I said, Morgan, I said, do you know who you are? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, whoa, 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 what you mean? I said, do you know? <laughs> you got royal blood running through your veins. And he happens to be with me today, Mr. Tim Morganfield. 
My man. <laughs> See, you've been laying back all this time, man. <laughs> I just thought you was over there doing the, you know, the good... The good oh, son kind of thing, you know, but no, that's Mr. Moore. Come here, man. I'm see you, brother. Good God okay. Almighty, man. Because when you talk about royalty, oh, man. you can you, you don't know here where, you know, <laughs> we ain't in the witness protection program or nothing. You know? <laughs> okay, man. Come on over here and have a seat, man. man. Okay. This is such an honor, man, because for, for some of us who, you know, just study wow. and appreciate the, the historical significance of who people are, the Rolling Stones wouldn't be the Rolling Stones without his folks, you know. And so you going to bring a little bit of that with you, man? Oh, man, I, I'm more like, <laughs> I play the air piano. <laughs> hey, he's I'm playing your instrument. <laughs> we well, got room for two of them. I know, I know. I'm, I'm more on the business side. Uh -huh. and, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Uncle yeah. Bobby, you don't have this flyer, but these are the sons of Muddy Waters. And they're coming. Really? Joseph and Big these Bill. Your yes. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And Tim is responsible for them being here. He's responsible for this festival. Joseph executive Mojo. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's, he got to be serious about it. <laughs> he is. He's very serious. There's one wow. more son, Mud. We didn't get him, but we'll get him next year. Wow. And these tickets are unbelievably reasonable because these artists, when they go overseas, including Barbara, it's a wonder they come back home. But these are twenty dollars per person in advance, forty dollars per person at the door. And not only will the music be all right on all of these shows, I mean, just coming home for people who live outside of the community, that is so important to go somewhere where you feel home. And that's what the Merck Park has been. And thanks to people like Brother James here, who going to spend the last. He's the father. Of, he's the father of the oh, Merck Park. Oh, yeah. I just, Everybody I just depends on him. We really ain't got time for father. He is the Merck Park. Park. We don't talk about that. Man. Yeah. But you know, Barbara, Barbara, and the Muddy Water Blues Festival is going to be the anchor to, uh, you know, what I used to try to do year round with the marketplace was create a destination. Yeah. And we're trying now really to get everyone to work collectively together. So Lamert Park is Lamert Park Village campus mm. so that we literally can uh, have this event happen every year with everyone in way of knowing it's going to come and uh, to transform Lamert Park into an entire performance space, not just outdoors but inside as well. Mm -hmm. so. That's so important. Barbara, I know you got to get to your gig, and uh, we're going to bring uh, Sister Bowers, Cowan, and Greg. Where did Greg go? Oh, he's he's still in the building. Okay, then we're going to finish up the second part of this set. And uh, if you're in the L.A. area, it would be a wonderful thing if you join us over at Pips. At, what's the address again? I said 1350. Oh, it's 1356. 1356 La Brea. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What if they want to get tickets for the Blues Festival? What do they call yes. it? Yes. Uh, BarbaraMorrison.com. They're on sale yes. right now. BarbaraMorrison.com. You can go to your PayPal. Man, let's sell that out tickets. and make them add a yes. couple more shows. Yeah. <laughs> they will stick around now if that yeah. money's straight. You know. Talk about what? the workshop. Yeah. Not only do we have the festival... Okay. Uh, Mosa has her Juneteenth festival at the same time, and what we're uh, get presenting to her is educational. Big Bill and Joseph are going to do a lecture, a blues lecture. Wow. Then they have ex 15 uh, portraits of their family as Muddy Water as a family person, and then they're bringing his guitar. Wow. So are they in Chicago? Uh, Atlanta and, and Chicago. Chicago. And Chicago. Chicago is what I mean. And, yes. and then we'll have a jam session so the public the who, the people who play guitar in our area can come and jam with them. Are you going to tell them where the jam session is going to be? It's going to be at the California Jazz and Blues <laughs> Museum the in, the 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 alley. Alley. in the alley. We got it. Jazz in the alley. I'm from Reed Alley, so I know all about that alley <laughs> oh, thing. Man. Yes, sir. So we'll be right black after we you know reconfigure here. Barbara, thank you so thank much. You, thank, thank you, Uncle Bobby. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Bobby. You've been taking care of this sister, man. I know. And she deserves it, and, and it just says a lot about who you are, too, oh, man. Yes, really good friend. Yeah, yeah. So we'll be right black. All right.
Oh man, we are black and uh, reconfigured here once again with Greg and Vivian Bowers slash Cowan, you know, before I get it reversed. <laughs> so, but you had a you had a comment you, you wanted to make, uh Viv. Yes, I wanted to share that not only did my parents um start the legacy of the dry cleaning business, but they spun off into um real estate. And they currently own uh, multiple pieces of property. But more importantly, they had the foresight to buy the block um, that the cleaners is on. Mm. So, And that, what's that address? 2509 South Central. 2509. Now, y'all still pick up, too, right? Oh, yes. We mm-hmm. pick up and deliver. As I mentioned earlier, that's mm-hmm. one of the reasons we keep the peace between us. Not that we have a problem. But... He's, it would show yeah, on your face if you did. Yes, it would. <laughs> <laughs> he, he is the mobile, and I'm the brick and mortar, okay. and that that works. So the reason that's important again is twenty five. What's the phone number? Two one three seven four nine thirty two thirty seven. One more time. Two one three seven four nine thirty two thirty seven. So if you're in the greater Los Angeles area. There's no excuse for you not to just pick that phone up and they'll come get your clothes and bring them back to you. (laughs) That's right. Okay. Some of the stuff we just got to do because it's convenient Mm -hmm. and it impacts us economically. So back to the property. And as I mentioned earlier, they have uh, many pieces of property and and they pass that on as a legacy to we as young people, um, my brothers and I, and we all own property. Keeping that thought in mind, I want to... Go back to what you were saying about gentrification. Mm-hmm. We see it all over. Mm-hmm. We see it especially in Lambert Park. And thank yeah. you so much for being there and and keeping Lambert Park whole and in the black. Uh, I am so afraid with the gentrification that we're going to lose it. Yeah, and there, there are some issues in there right now that we're dealing with. You know, and we'll talk about it, but, uh, you know, we'll maybe maybe this show, but there's some issues about a major or an owner of property there allowing it to be empty until they get to the point where, you know, what happens, it changes the look of the community. I don't really have a huge problem with people moving into our community. I do have a problem with them trying to move into our community and change the culture of sure. our community. And so with this project that Marquis Harris Dawson is doing called Destination Crenshaw, Okay. It really talks about the contribution of African Americans, unapologetically about African Americans, not anyone else, but our contributions to the world, and then what's happening along with uh, Lamert Park uh, right now. That this area will still be unapologetic about being black, in Los Angeles. That's wonderful. Yeah. It's necessary because we should have, we got to have learned from what happened to Central Avenue all over the country. Mm-hmm. You know, because Harlem used to be just so thriving area of creativity and art and culture and all of those things and what we didn't realize until these places just died all over the country that we died with it exactly. yeah, but it's, that's a systematic way of, de- of destroying communities and it has a lot to do with the leadership in the community yes a lot to do yes. with where we invest our money in the mm-hmm. community yes a lot to do with the political people that we 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 put in the office in the community mm-hmm. and a lot to do with bad banking in our community you know, you mentioned Marquise Dawson by name, and 
I want to salute him because he's a young brother who's serving his first term in the 8th District here in Los Angeles. And it's inspiring for him to take that initiative Mm-hmm. To, and that position mm-hmm. that, hey, this might be the last frontier. Yeah, it is. And it in is. many ways it is. And we have to rally around young brothers like that, our sisters, mm-hmm. whoever. I don't care if they're white, black, or whatever. If they're committed to maintaining the integrity of this community, actually it's, it's healthy for the city. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. with the train we're, coming yeah, through we're, here. We're in a very good yeah. place this time because we have three African-American council people mm-hmm. who are actually mm-hmm. talking to one another mm. and actually working together. I mean, my first meeting with Kern, I, I was trying to get Kern to look at the idea of the economy and cultural economy and the, econ- the economic impact of culture around this country. Mm-hmm. You know, during those years, the African marketplace made the list of top 100 events in North America, including Disneyland, all of those events because the focus was on the economic contribution by African Americans. Mm -hmm. And I told Curran, I said, you know, you really need to think about Central Avenue, because I was involved in starting the Central Avenue Jazz Festival. But I didn't like the way it's gone in the last few years, because Mm -hmm. you wouldn't know that it was done to pay honor and tribute to the same thing Barbara Morrison's doing through these African American uh, musicians Mm -hmm. who stayed at the Dunbar, could only stay at the Biltmore Hotel when they came to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Those are the only two hotels they can stay. And then then it changed. And I said, you know, you might want to look at taking the approach to the Latino, Chicano, Mexican, and uh, community in South L.A., this long Central Avenue of business, that they need to look at the contribution of African Americans and be comfortable with it, mm-hmm. right. you know, and begin to promote that because it's going to help their business, right. you know, and not just try to say, we're just coming in and taking our community back. You know, and that's the challenge in South LA. But we can do it if we have to open our mindset to do it and understand if we get them to understand the value of culture mm. and not look at culture as a frill. Let mm-hmm. those black people sing and dance on that stage for one festival one time a year, and we won't have a fr- we won't have a riot during the summer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that, to me, that's the mentality. And sure. I've talked all over the world saying, look, I can get out of bed and do a festival, mm-hmm. you know, but I can't get out of bed and do a, a an event that's planned along the lines of a theme park or World's Fair, mm-hmm. you know, or a county fair, mm-hmm. where the jobs of mom and pop businesses are actually putting money into the community. They're hiring people. They're paying taxes. because They have a contribution to the community. And when our community doesn't see the mom and pop cottage businesses mm-hmm. in terms of the value that they have, then we've lost. Mm-hmm. And that's what's been happening over the last 30, 40, 50 years in our community. Yes. To that degree, um, as Barbara lit up, when she looked at this brother, um, when I was living in San Diego back in the uh, late 80s, uh, a mutual friend of ours, Hawthorne James, better known as Big Red, um, had just done the uh, Five Heartbeats. Mm-hmm. And San, they, they did a screening in San Diego, and I met him, man, and he, he kind of just clicked with me, and he said, man, uh, I live in L.A., and I'll be at the uh, African Marketplace this weekend. I'm like, what's the African Marketplace? <laughs> and uh, he said, man, great food, beautiful women, Great food, beautiful, beautiful women. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'll be there. <laughs> so I drove up, and what I saw, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Mm-hmm. So, James, kind of give us a, the, 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 the abridged version. Yeah, I'll give you a quickie. You know, yes, yes. Uh, when I grew up, I was director of the, um, I worked at L.A. Southwest College, director of community service with them for a couple of years. And I was a deputy for Bob Farrell's office, who covered the 8th Council District. And I was at Inner City Cultural Center, and and I, you know, and I remember in 1965 they started the Watts Festival. Remember Tommy mm-hmm, Jaquette mm-hmm. and the Watts Festival, mm-hmm. right? And then they had the Festival in Black. Jackie Tatum did that, and then you had uh, Alonzo uh, with the Brockman Gallery doing the Caravana Festival. But all those festivals seemed to die out after 10 years. First of all, the sponsors didn't seem that they were valuable enough. They wouldn't put the money into it. The political leaders said, "Well, we've already done our dog and pony show. We stood up there on the stage and see what we did." And mm-hmm. so they were never designed to have long-term energy. Mm-hmm. And so I said, well, anytime black people did something in L.A., there's no place to take your family when they visit or friends to have a black experience in L.A. Because we have no year-round. Right. But you still have Universal City Walk. You have Old Town Pasadena. You have Third <laughs> Street Promenade. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You have the Disneylands and Knott's Berry Farm. You even have Alvera Street where we founded this city. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, but you have nothing, if you think of nothing in the black community. And I grew up on 103rd and Corocious. And you know where that is. <laughs> I, went to, I, grew, I went to Markham. I went to Compton <laughs> High School. I went to, all my education was on the south side of town. I went to Pepperdine L.A. campus. 
Okay, mm-hmm. so I said, why don't we take what we do mm-hmm. and create a commercially viable uh, uh, economic center called the African Marketplace and Cultural Fair? Why don't we take all of the vendors and train them to become full commercial merchants and not mm-hmm. vendors, mm-hmm. you know, which minimizes your value? Mm-hmm. And because the way the, the powers that be who are, who are sponsoring it would do, they'll minimize you too. And then why not take what we're capable of doing, let, why not build the audience bigger by focusing on the African diaspora? There are more African diaspora and people in Los Angeles than African Americans. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When you start a- a- adding up the Jamaicans and the Bahamians and the Ghanaians and the Salvadorans and the, and the uh, Belizeans and the Panamanians, all here in L.A., and even those from Veracruz, Mexico, that are black, mm. you know, you have a huge market. Mm-hmm. And all you have to do is train them to respect each other by, along the lines of not cultural differences, but cultural similarities. Mm-hmm. Right. And so the marketplace was designed to do just that. But all through that process, I had to fight people who don't look like us around this table, say, well, you compromise the integrity of the arts. No, I'm not. I'm doing the same thing you're doing. You're capitalizing on our music. You're capitalizing on our sound. You're capitalizing on how we walk, how we talk, how we greet each other. You're capitalizing on our culture. It can be bought, and you're buying and selling it. In fact, actually, you ain't buying it. You're stealing it, and you're selling it. Mm-hmm. And so what I would do is work solely pretty much against up, pushing this rock up the hill, mm-hmm. saying this is not a festival. Because they always want to minimize you as a festival. And I know what it takes to do a cleaners. My grandfather, the same thing. He came out of Chicago, and he started the cleaners <laughs> in uh, Pasadena in, 19, in the early 40s. And until the 1210 came through there and took all that property and took him out of business, you know. And the same thing with festivals. You know, all those festivals, all the work that Tommy Jaquette put into that festival, you realize he spent millions of dollars over the years. And he gave employment to millions of people. So you figure that's a multi-billion dollar event that's no longer here. Mm. The same thing with the Festival in Black. The African marketplace got to the point where I said to them, we're also not going to rely on people coming to be entertained. We're going to come and have people have an experience. Mm-hmm. You know, so they can understand why we're all so similar. We're going to have the African region. We're going to have the Caribbean region. We're going to have the Middle Passage region. We're going to have the North American region. We're going to have the Children's Village. We're going to have a food court. And we're going to have exhibitions all through here. And then and when they come in, we're going to educate them by having them come through the entrance through another exhibition. Mm-hmm. And we're not going to have uniform security. We're going to secure it simply by the essence of us being in this space together. Mm-hmm. So all it's going to be designed so that people are meandering and walking and speaking to one another. You know, they're not going to be allowed to just be in there. And then we're going to close up everything around us so that when you enter, you don't have to see a telephone pole anywhere. Mm. So it was all about the psyche of people, okay. not just African Americans, but people in general. Mm-hmm. So we we made the list of top 100 events in North America twice. And that's difficult because every state and province in Canada can nominate 29. Mm. And then it goes back to ABA back in D.C. and they vote on the top. Wow. They, because, and they, before they vote, they send someone out to see your event. Is it reverent? Is mm. it clean? And does it, have, does it make a statement? Does it stay true to its mission? You know? Right. And apparently people thought so. I mean, we still had challenges. I had a lot of racial challenges here in L.A., particularly where we, we did it. You know, even the department I worked for did, was not into sponsoring it. So I, I started it with myself. My first two vendors were my mother and, uh, uh, and, and what's his name, Brian Berea, mm. and the friends of the William Branch Art Center. So it's come a long way. But people, after eight years, uh, I haven't done it in eight years, and I stopped doing it on because I just woke up one day and said, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to fight with the city anymore. Mm-hmm. I tried to get them to realize that we need to build this permanently, whether it's around Lamert Park or whether it's over in Inglewood around the, uh, the hotel used to be at 30... Um, 90th and Prairie, and even the guy who owned the Hollywood racetrack mm-hmm. thought it was a great idea. As I said to the leadership there, and Doran was the, the mayor at the time, I said, this would be a good way to keep people in the city an extra three hours after they come from a Laker game or after they come from a hockey game, mm. after they come from a concert, to come early, stay later, and enjoy themselves because we have restaurants. We did everything in it that you would do at a theme park. Mm-hmm. We had Dorsey High School's culinary program uh, come over and operate a restaurant, and I brought in three different vendors in Los Angeles. Doolin's was one of them, mm-hmm. and uh, Uncle Darrell's was another, to actually work with them each weekend to teach them how to run a restaurant. Then we had the food court where they actually can go fill the orders from different foods from different parts of the African diaspora. Mm-hmm. Everything we did was different. I even created an amphitheater that seat 5,000 people, and I subcontract that to independent producers to produce themselves. Wow. 
It was all along the lines of business, you know. And that's what I say about gentrification. If we can coordinate ourselves in a, from a business sense and then talk about those people who are taking all the money from the churches and said, no, we're looking at investing in Lamert Park. Even right now, Lamert Park has a plan. We've had three charrettes, one by the Urban Land Institute and two by the Lamert Park stakeholders, where we talked about what our vision is for Lamert Park, what we want to see happen in Lamert Park. With the, with the line coming in there and opening in 2019, we want to make sure Lamert Park is a <coughs> replica of what we think our community is about. Mm-hmm. You know, so if we can have all, if we can have a Bowers Museum over there, we'd be great. <laughs> you know, on that note, <coughs> consistent with the theme, I think we've answered the question uh, affirmatively. Um, urban renewal does not have to be Negro <coughs> removal, but it, mm-hmm. it, it requires man strength and stubbornness, persistence, and collaboration. Mm-hmm. Um, and this brother has commissioned me to do a, uh, a documentation in the, in the literary form of his journey through the uh, uh, African marketplace, Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm excited Mm -hmm. about that because that's what I'm supposed to do is tell stories Mm -hmm. and the stories that that need to be told. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and, 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 and it enriches the lives of so many people, not just in this community, but around. It also leaves a a blueprint, at least footprint. I want to thank my guest tonight for coming on this show because we are at a crossroads um, in the so-called black world mm-hmm. and you use the phrase that, that Marquis Dawson is using being unapologetically black doesn't mean that you're anti-white or right. anybody else but it is necessary I think to illuminate the people who are winning in our community and again what's that number that they can call to get them clothes <laughs> picked up 213-749-3237 remember that number and use that number I mean you your clothes are your clothes, you know. You, you ought to know who the people that are cleaning them, you know, <laughs> and that it makes a difference that they clean those clothes in terms of the yeah. economic impact that it has in our community. This brother here, you're going to be seeing him recurring uh, on this show because we're in the, in the process of making sure from the, the, the construction side of the Lamert Park area, the Vision Theater where he's temporarily housed right now. I'm overseeing the $35 million restoration of the Vision Theater right now. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. we're trying to make sure that people who look like those of us We're going to the make table, sure that happens. We're going to be yeah. there. Yeah. Good. We're going to make that happen because he's got the presence of mind, and I know some people who are qualified to do that work. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that hopefully will establish that pattern going forward because yeah. we're going to see just unbelievable development along this corridor. It's yes. just mind-boggling. Yeah. And again, a salute out to Marquis Dawson for being instrumental in surrounding him with people who can allow that to happen in a way that is irrefutable, right. you know. So on that note, I want to share a quick um, financial note with, with everybody out there since it's, it's our money. We're getting ready to um, absorb $300 billion of additional debt next week. Because we don't pay attention to what's going on. We owe China so much money that just the the interest on the debt is a hundred million dollars a day. A day. A day. I mean these are the kind of figures that make your head explode. But the reason I want to close on that note is we must pay more attention to what they do with our money. The thirty five million dollar renovation that's coming out of our pockets. Mm-hmm. And I want to use this platform to give people the kind of information that will hopefully favorably impact your lives. So for tuning in tonight, I want to thank everybody. And in closing, I'd like to say, Paul, this once again, thank you, sister, for micing us up and letting us do what we do here at Uncle Bobby's Country Corner. And thank you for letting me be myself again. See you next week, I hope. Tell somebody. Thank you, Uncle Bobby. <laughs>